Rachel Baumberger with Erdman's Publishing. Joining me today is Marilyn McIntyre, who is author of the new book, Word by Word, A Daily Spiritual Practice. Welcome, Marilyn. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. It's great to have you. A couple of years ago, you wrote a book for us called What's in a Phrase, where you took these tiny little snippets, two or three words sometimes, and you would write these really lovely meditations on them, phrases from scripture. Mm -hmm. This time, you've gone even further, and you've written an entire book about single words. Why did you feel like this was a book you needed to write? <laughs> well, both of these books come out of the practice of Lectio Divina, which I think more and more Protestants are familiar with. It's been a practice in the Catholic Church since St. Benedict in the fifth century. But that is the practice of taking a word or phrase, listening for a word or phrase as you read a short passage of scripture. A deeply subjective process of just allowing yourself to be addressed and noticing where a passage might stop you. It might be a prepositional phrase, like in Christ, or it might be just a word like shepherd or a verb. And so, what I find really rich about that practice is not only that it surprises you into reflecting on things you didn't expect, but it's pretty right brain. Um, and so I find myself enriched by it in ways that other devotional practices have, haven't quite. Yeah, so that led me to just consider some of my favorite phrases in scripture. One of them I gave a whole baccalaureate address about at Westmont one year, which was Wings of the Morning. Remember in Psalm 139, though I take the wings of the morning and go to the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will hold me. I don't have any idea what Wings of the Morning means. It's just so beautiful. So I asked a Hebrew teacher who was there at the time, and he didn't know either. <laughs> but imagine what an artist would do with that. And yeah, so I think phrases have the value of not making a claim or um, inviting you into argument or rational thought. They just open a door to let the spirit in. Mm -hmm. And words do the same and thing. And words do the same thing. So yes, the instruction in Lexio Divina is listen for the word or phrase that addresses you. Mm -hmm. And so these were words that came from that kind of listening. How did you choose the words? One of the things that was very interesting to me is that these aren't big fancy theological words. These are simple, ordinary words. Okay. Listen, ask. How did you pull this list together? They came from exactly the process I was describing of just re reflecting on words that would come up in the course of reading scripture or reading poetry or reading something that connected with and led me back into prayer. Sometimes they came as a kind of instruction in prayer. I imagine this is a fairly common experience in private prayer when you're just trying to sink into centering prayer or meditation, and centering prayer, of course, focuses on a single word, usually. Um, but sometimes the word would come as a sort of instruction, listen, as though I was, it was being spoken to me, it's not something that I was generating. Or accept, or let go, that's a big one. I was doing a women's retreat one time and I asked people, I play around with lists a lot, and I asked the women to um, make a list of things to let go of, and one of them said, I don't want to make that list. <laughs> it was <laughs> way too scary. And let go is kind of a scary word, but yeah, I think all of these words are invitations and instructions and reminders that I experience as something received. One thing I didn't notice the first time I read through the list, but as soon as I saw it, I couldn't unsee it. They're all verbs. They are all verbs. Why did you make them all verbs? Well, I could give you my English teacher lecture about how the verb <laughs> is the linchpin of the <laughs> sentence, and also that when God gave Moses God's very own name, it was a verb. But I also just think that um, 
verbs are where the energy of life is in the sentence. Naming things, nouns fix things, and verbs release them and open them. And right, so what verbs do when you read them is invite you or direct you or guide you or give you pause or make you resist. But um, the engagement with a sentence comes with a verb, which is why you should never resort to weak verbs. <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> <laughs> now, to, to make this project even more interesting for us and challenging for you, you didn't just write about each word one time. Right. Can you tell us a bit about how you structured the book, which I know had to have been a creative challenge for you. Well, I didn't intend it that way. I thought I would just write a meditation on each word, the way I had done what's in a phrase. But then they are so rich. There are all kinds of ways to think of listening or letting go or accepting or watching. And also, if you go to my website, you'll see that I have another practice of list making. I really like lists. And in fact, a few of my lists have been published and I've gotten letters from people saying, oh, I really liked your poem. And I think, it wasn't a poem, it was a list. <laughs> but in fact, lists do that. They, as you begin to make them, they open up new ways of thinking about things. And so when I would write about, I don't know, receive, then receive what comes. I'm not reciting because I don't remember the whole list, but receive what comes, receive what's given, receive um, what you've been resisting or something, mm -hmm. but just thinking about where the verb takes you opens up new doors or avenues of reflection. And so then the thought of doing, staying with a word for a whole week came up and I thought, that actually happens. It happens naturally. Doesn't that happen to you when you sometimes hear a word and it just kind of strikes you and then it keeps coming up in conversation? It does. It does. It's like a song snippet that won't leave your head for a few days in a row. The word yeah. just stays with you. Yeah, so I thought to make that more intentional would be to say, I'm just going to live with this word for a week mm -hmm. and see how it comes back to me and see how it enables me to listen for it and listen into it differently. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a surprising practice. I recommend it. Yeah, well, and it's, it's interesting that we use the word practice with this book, that this is a daily spiritual practice that you're laying out for people. And in that way, the book is not only to be read, but to be used. How can people use this book to cultivate a spiritual practice that they might, that might not have ever occurred to them previously? Yeah, I don't, I don't think of what I have written as the primary purpose of the book. I think the purpose of the book is to, in effect, offer and model a process that I would invite other people to try, which is, you know how the Iron Chef says, do not try this at home. <laughs> I think, try this at home. Yes. <laughs> um, so I would hope that the book would be an invitation to listen for the words or phrases that invite you to reflection and then to accept the task of just staying with them. One of the things I've found myself saying in classrooms repeatedly over the years is stay with this. If somebody makes a point, well stay with that a little bit longer. If you say a little, find yourself saying a little more than you intended to say, you will surprise yourself into saying something that takes you to a new level. Mm -hmm. So I would like it to just offer one among many models of a practice that slows you down and helps you to go inward rather than onward. There's so much momentum to go onward in the culture. Yeah, that's, that's a great point that we are bombarded with a quantity of words every day. I open my phone and I have a dozen apps ready to spit words, words, words out at me. And here you're telling people, slow down, take the words one at a time. Can a word, a single word, speaking of this as a spiritual practice, be a prayer all in itself? Well, yes. I think both the practice of Lectio Divina and centering prayer are testimonies to that. Centering prayer 
is a practice of simply finding or receiving a word that is a place to come back to as you enter into silence. And the word is a kind of anchor or axis. And you don't use it for its indicative content, quality. You use it as a place, to, place of return that opens up a constellation of associations that become your personal kaleidoscope. And it can be words that are not just what I would consider the, my favorite one word, one word okay. prayer. Help. 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 <laughs> well, you know, Anne Lamott had that little book, Help, Thanks, yes. and Wow, as her three prayers. Yeah. And I think part of the appeal of the book is that people recognize in that those moments when one word does become a prayer. And help is one of them. Mm -hmm. Did you have any favorite words? as you were writing this book. Obviously, you love them all, but any that yeah. really were extremely fun or extremely insight-giving to you personally? Well, I did like listen. That's the one I began with because I have spent a lot of time with students over the years talking about what good listening entails and help helping them, I hope, to complicate their understanding of what it means to listen well, to listen literally to, into a conversation, and then to read well by listening to the text. I taught a little experimental one-unit course at Westmont one year with a colleague um, called Conversational English for Native Speakers, <laughs> hoping to help people retrieve the art of conversation. And one of the one of the tasks was to learn to listen with intention to listen for the words that are spoken, not just the gist. And one of the examples I used was a woman I knew and revered who would listen. She'd always lean in when she listened, and she listened verbatim, which is to say, when you said something, she would notice how you put it. And she would often say, oh, I like the way you put that. It makes me think of this. And she would make her own little association that would take us in a new direction. But listening for the way I put things surprised me into reflecting on what I had said. Mm. So listen was a good one. The other one I would comment on is the word dare is in there. And I didn't start with that. I started with be not afraid, because I love that. But my beloved editor here at Erdman's <laughs> said, well, that's not a word. It's a phrase. <laughs> so she said, can you substitute a word for that? And I thought, it, it took me a couple of days to think what would be a substitute for be not afraid. And then I thought of dare. And I went back and rethought all of the little pieces I'd written and the word really grew on me. It, you hear it in a lot of bumper sticker contexts, um, dare to be different, and so on. But I thought about being daring as, and the spiritual dimension of that challenge. Mm -hmm. So that was a fun one, because I didn't intend it as I started. Oh, I'm glad that that worked out. That's one of my favorites. <laughs> Well, by listening to the words and by daring to write about them, you've put together a really beautiful and I think very useful book for people. So I thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank you for being here with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. <laughs> Been talking with Marilyn McIntyre. Her new book is Word by Word.